I'm so hyped from the last video for doing this. This this is this is gonna be fun. Uh, yeah, this is also gonna be a long video as well. Oh Jesus! Hey, what is going on, everybody? My name is Payne, and welcome back to another Studio Ghibli review video, and easily. Uh, one of the few that I've been looking forward to make for a while, basically since I started making this series. And uh, it is easily one of my favorite Studio Ghibli films uh, that were made, not just by Hayao Miyazaki, but by the studio itself. Yeah, this was the first movie, in my opinion, since either Porco Rosso or Kiki's Delivery Service. I, I, I'm going to say Kiki's Delivery Service here, where I am seeing this so many people uh, express their gratitude for this film on social media, particularly on Instagram where they post pictures of a bunch of stuff related to the movies. Uh, of course, there's the uh, typical Twitter posts and posts everywhere else on social media saying that this film is amazing and that this film changed my life, etc, etc, stuff like that. This is what makes talking about these films very special is because these are films that changed people's uh, perception of life. Uh, and this film is on the dot, something like that. This is uh, the same amount of information, if not more, than End of Evangelion. And keep in mind, that was like 20 minutes long. So I'm just going to stop freaking going off on a tangent. I'm going to stop stalling. I'm just going to get into this. Here is the one and the only Princess Mononoke. Princess Mononoke is a historical fantasy war epic film. That was written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki, was produced by Toshio Suzuki, and was made by Studio Ghibli. It came out in Japan on July 12th of 1997 uh, in theaters, and it came out in theaters in the U.S. on October 29th, 1999. And on Blu-ray, it came out in Japan in 2013, in the United States in 2014, and G-Kids got the rights to distribute it back in 2017? And... It is currently 133 minutes long, or 2 hours and 13 minutes long, which as of the making of this video, because there's currently a Ghibli film in, uh, in the works right now, it is the longest Studio Ghibli film. Alright, so uh, I, I think I'm just going to go out of my, just make this quick. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the plot extensively, because I have to in order to ex try to get everything else out of the way. So, spoilers, you have been warned. Alright, so set in a fantastical version of Muromachi, Japan, which is somewhere between 5th, 13th to 15th century Japan, uh, the movie starts when Ashitaka, who is the last prince of his Amishi village, kills a demon, but not before it corrupts his right arm, making him superhuman, but also slowly killing him at the same time. He later finds out that the demon was a boar god named Nago, who was corrupted by an iron ball that was lodged in his body, and the village's wise woman tells Ashitaka that he may find a cure uh, where Nago came from, but if he goes over to where it is, he can't return to his village. While he is heading west, Ashitaka meets an opportunist Buddhist monk named Jigo, who tells that he may find help from the Great Forest Spirit, who is seen as a deer-like animal by day and a giant quote-unquote night walker by night. And nearby on a cliffside, a group of men herd oxen to the industrial territory of Irontown, led by a woman known only as Lady Emoshi, and repel an attack by a wolf pack led by a wolf goddess named Moro, and riding one of the wolves is a human girl named San. Ashitaka then discovers two injured Irontown men and carries them through the forest where he encounters many what are known as Kodama, which for anyone who's never seen the movie before or doesn't know what I'm talking about, there are those little like green forest spirits that, that make the clicking noise. I absolutely love those things so much. And he also has glimpses of the forest spirit in his deer-like form. And also during that time as well, either if I had to guess, probably while he's getting the men out or while he's heading out west, he sees the uh, says sees the wolf god Moro along with uh, the human girl San in the now famous image that is the poster for the movie. And when he goes over to Iron Town, Ashitaka learns that Iboshi built the town by clear cutting forests to claim iron sand and produce iron, leading to conflicts with the forest gods and a local feudal lord named Asano, and is a refuge for social outcasts, including lepers who are employed to manufacture firearms, uh, this, which were the same ones that were used to wound the boar god, which Ashitaka killed, but not before the boar god corrupt him, corrupted him. Iboshi later explains that San, the human girl that was riding on the wolf with the wolf pack, was raised by the wolves as one of their own, and because of seeing what Lady Iboshi did and Irontown has been doing, uh, has 
eventually resented humankind's sense. About shortly afterwards, San infiltrates Iron Town to kill Eboshi, but Ashitaka intervenes, knocking them both unconscious somehow. Uh, but as he leaves, he is unintentionally shot by a villager, but the curse, the curse gives him the strength to carry her out of the village, even though he just got shot. When San awakens, he prepares to kill Ashitaka, but hesitates when he tells her that she's beautiful, because with a, with a Ghibli film, that, that seems to be a, a reoccurring pattern. She then takes him to a forest and decides to trust him after the forest spirit saves his life. Meanwhile, a boar clan, which is led by the blind boar god Akato, plans to attack Iron Town to save the forest, Meanwhile, Eboshi prepares for battle and sets out to kill the forest spirit with Jigo, the monk that Ashitaka met earlier, who actually ends up working for Iron Town. And her reasoning was that she intended to give the god's head to the emperor in return for protection from Lord Asano, as according to legend, the forest spirit's head grants immortality. So Ashitaka recovers from his wound, but remains cursed, and then he returns to Iron Town to find it taken over by samurai, so he goes back to warn Lady Eboshi about what's going on, but as he was trying to find her, finds Okado uh, corrupted by his wounds and just taken over by battle, uh, basically explaining that Jiro's men tricked him into finding where the forest spirit is and alongside Lady Eboshi, and then Lady Eboshi then decapitates the forest spirit, because you know, you're supposed to, because again, you, you, have, you have the head, then you have immortality. So it's deca so he decapitates him. As this is going on, the freaking forest spirit just bleeds out ooze all over the forest. It's it's weird just looking at it, uh, and just kills anything that it touches. And it was at this point that the forest starts to die as well as the Kodama as well. Uh, meanwhile, Moro, who was trying to uh, prevent the forest spirit uh, from getting killed. She gets freaking decapitated as well. Her head comes alive and bites off Eboshi's right arm, uh, but she eventually does survive. After the samurai flee from Iron Town and is evacuated, Ashitaka and San, uh, they pursue Jigo and they retrieve the head, returning it to the forest spirit. The spirit then dies as the sun rises, supposedly, but its form washes over the land and heals any part of the forest that was dead. Uh, and Ashitaka's curse is then lifted, uh, He's no longer corrupted by the uh, curse on the arm. And the movie ends with Ashitaka staying to help rebuild Iron Town and promising San that he would visit her in the forest. And with Lady Eboshi reuniting with the townspeople and vowing to build a better town. So the idea for Princess Mononoke actually started back in the late 1970s when the director Hayao Miyazaki started drawing sketches about a princess that lived in the woods with a beast. Uh, the story was later made into a children's book of the same name, Mononoke Hime in 1980 with a plot that was very similar to Beauty and the Beast in the sense that instead of the princess being raised by a spirit, she was actually forced to marry one. In fact, he actually wanted this story to be adapted into an anime after he directed 1984's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, uh, but before eventually Laputa Castle in the Sky was chosen and was made into an anime film about a couple years after Nausicaa. So it's really hard thinking about it now, but Miyazaki almost made a children's version, or at least compared to this one, a children's version of Princess Mononoke as the first film that Studio Ghibli ever made. It's hard to believe it now because of all the films that came and, and just the impact that it had, but it, it's really hard to think about really just a different reality when it comes to making Ghibli films. As for the film itself, he started writing the plotline in August of 1994, but he was having a hard time writing them since the sketches that he wrote 14 years earlier, A, looked very similar to another film that he directed, which was My Neighbor Totoro, and B, there was a lot that changed since he wrote the book. He wanted to make it uh, relevant to the time frame. So he just got freaking writer's block and decided to accept a request to a to direct a music video for a song called On Your Mark by soft rock artists, artists Shage and Asuka. And after that, he then returned to the project with a fresh start and new ideas to go off of. And in 1995, he started writing the initial storyboards for the movie. And during the time until the storyboards were finished in April of 1997, Ghibli animators went to a number of forests and mountains for location scouting, uh, which ended up being the same places where Miyazaki and his animators went for Nausicaa uh, of the Valley of the Wind, the same places. And the studio finished making in total 144,000 animation cells for the film, 
all of which Miyazaki personally looked over and supposedly redrew 80,000 of them. There was a rumor that instead of Miyazaki redrawing 80,000 of them, he just straight up drew 80,000 of them himself, which would be incredible, but uh, that would later be debunked as shown in a documentary that showed the making of the movie titled Making of Mononoke Hime, which came out a little after The Princess Mononoke came out, the actual film. After the movie came out, it was produced with a budget of 23.5 million US dollars or 2.35 billion yen, which if I remember cor correctly at the time, that was the most money that was ever used to make a film uh, in Japan and got 14.5 billion yen or 159 million US dollars in the box office, which made it the highest grossing film in Japan in 1997. This was a spot that Studio Ghibli has gotten used to. Uh, most of their films recently have just been the highest grossing film in Japan. I think Porco Rosso in 92, uh, Pom Poco 94, Whisper of the Heart 95, you know, they were all top of the charts in Japan that year. It was not only the number one movie in 1997, it was the number one movie of all time in Japan, basically, taking over a spot that was supposedly held by Steven Spielberg's E.T. for the last 15 years, uh, it, and it was then broken by James Cameron's Titanic, which was then broken by Studio Jilly Spirited Away, which was then broken about a few years ago by Makoto Shinkai's Your Name. And in addition to how much it made in theaters, it made approximately 260 million US dollars in video releases in both Japan and the United States uh, as of the making of this video. So it is just very, very incredible. It's also the all-time best-selling video in Japan, uh, selling more than 4 million copies until that record was broken by Titanic. Uh, it's just very incredible what this what this movie has done. And as for the actual production of the movie, it was mostly hand-drawn, but also incorporates some use of computer animation during five minutes of footage throughout the film. Uh, this is something that uh, Whisper of the Heart kind of had a little, but Princess Mononoke really delved into that way more. The computer animated parts are designed to blend in and support the traditional cell animation and are mainly used in images consisting of a mixture of computer-generated graphics and traditional drawing. Drawing. There was a further 10 minutes that were uh, that uses ink and painted, a technique that Studio Ghibli has used for a very long time. However, pr the producers agreed on the installation of computers to successfully complete the film prior to the Japanese premiere date. This is the first time that Studio Ghibli has ever done this. Uh, there was also a couple other outside sources that help with the film, such as TMS Kyoku. Kyokuichi Corporation, who are now known today as TMS Animation, they helped animate the film, and a Korean animation studio known as DR Movie helped with the painting process for Princess Mononoke. Adding to what I said with the Whisper in the Heart review, this was also the first time that Miyazaki considered retirement. Uh, he said at a press conference for Princess Mononoke that this would be the final time that he would make films quote-unquote in this way, which meant that he was going to pay attention to making short films for the upcoming Studio Ghibli Museum, which today there's a lot of them. But the media ran away with that statement and basically said that he was retiring entirely from Studio Ghibli instead. But even though it was Miyazaki's goal to keep making films anyway for the Studio Ghibli Museum, in reality, he felt that he was getting too old. He was saying that, you know, his eyes weren't too good as they were as they used to be, and that his hands could no longer move that quickly while making the film. And he felt that spending every day for more than two years working on the film took too much out of them. Hence, he said that he wouldn't direct a film in that way anymore. It took a lot out of them. The movie took a lot out of them. He also said that he was going to help out a few young and upcoming animators by producing and writing more films, but sadly, according to the eulogy that he wrote for the late Yoshifumi Kondo, who directed Whisper of the Heart, there was apparently going to be another film that Kondo was going to be directing and Miyazaki was going to be writing, adding on to uh, another reason why he's retiring. He said that Kondo's death was supposedly another reason. And with that, on January 14th, 1998, he left Studio Ghibli and fortunately came back all, a little over a year later on January 16th, 1999 uh, as the head of Studio Ghibli. He also did the exact same thing when he finished up Spirited Away in 2001, but we're going to get more than that when we review that movie. There were also some rumors going around uh, surrounding Princess Mononoke and its supposed connection with Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, backed up by a number of similarities, such as the characters, the setting, the genre, and the theme of 
humans versus nature, among many others. But one striking example of a connection is revealed in the Japanese trailer for the film. Uh, we're going to be showing it on the screen. It's a very low-quality Japanese trailer where there is a line of text that says 13 years since Nausicaa, which lines up perfectly since Nausicaa came out 13 years before Princess Mononoke in 1984. But the question is, why was it put there? Uh, as I said when I reviewed Nausicaa a long time ago, Miyazaki didn't like the ending to the movie as the manga he created that inspired the movie wasn't finished until 10 years after the movie came out in 1994. And Miyazaki decided that in Princess Mononoke that the conclusion of the film will be that conflicts between humans and nature were never good in the first place, rather than it could be resolved in a positive light. There was also another supposed connection between Mononoke and Nausicaa for its distribution to America, as mentioned in the Nausicaa review before it was properly dubbed. Nausicaa had a dubbed release in 1985 called Warriors of the Wind, which, to put it lightly, was a shit show through and through, and one thing Miyazaki hated about it was that it cut out parts of the movie to make the story just entirely different. So he said that if any more of his movies were to be distributed to America, there would be no cuts or, you know, there would be no more Ghibli films that would go to America. However, in 1998, when Miyazaki flew to Los Angeles to meet with Miramax Films, who were dubbing the film, and its chairman, who I'm pretty sure is completely well-known for something else now, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Weinstein wanted to make cuts on the film to make it more marketable to U.S. audiences. It was then rumored that in response, when Miyazaki went back to Japan, he supposedly sent a katana to Weinstein that said, no cuts on it. That's pretty badass. <laughs> One thing about this film that was pretty fun to decipher is the number of themes that Miyazaki put in this movie. Uh, it's just a lot to go through. One of the more obvious ones was a theme about the environment and how it could be seen by some that the supernatural powers in the movie is another way to represent the dwindling of the overall environmental landscape. A couple more themes that were found in the film were sexuality and disability, to which Miyazaki confirms is in the film by saying in an interview that he was inspired to portray people with leprosy in the film after going to a nearby sanitarium, and it's believed that seeing people with that bad of an incurable disease is one of the driving forces for Lady Eboshi, but it's also believed that the disabled citizens were seen as a turning point towards a more modern society. Uh, another theme is mankind's growth and development versus nature's preservation, and that Miyazaki did an amazing job of showing both sides of the argument, basically. In this case, it is San versus Lady Eboshi. Unlike some of Miyazaki's other films that have a protagonist and an antagonist, with Princess Mononoke, you can make an argument that both San and Lady Eboshi are the protagonists and the antagonists. It really just depends on who you ask. You have San who defends the forest and the viewers, there are viewers that emphasize with her, but she also attacks innocent people, complicating how we evaluate her. And opposed to her is Lady Eboshi who tries to destroy the forest and could be considered a villain, but everything that she does is out of a desire to protect her village and see it prosper. So San and Lady Eboshi, I said at the end of the movie, they both survive, which defies the usual convention of good triumphing over eagle, evil with the antagonist defeated. If you believe that mankind needs to clear out more land and develop more space in order to survive and thrive, then you would probably see Lady Eboshi as the protagonist. You would probably root for her. But if you are someone who wants to preserve nature and keep animals safe from extinction, and believe me, I know a couple of people who absolutely believe that, then you would think San is the protagonist. Another theme that was theorized to be in the film was lost innocence, something that Miyazaki had also implemented in a past film. Uh, in this case, it was Porco Rosso putting it in after he was inspired from looking at the uh, what was going on in Yugoslavia, the wars in Yugoslavia, to which he said that it was an example of mankind never learning, which made it hard for him to make any other films like Kiki's Delivery Service and any other, you know, just good-natured films like that because he believes that it was giving younger viewers the wrong message. And the final theme that I could find with Princess Mononoke, I am pretty sure there's absolutely just probably a few more, uh, was the difference between individualism and social conformity, which is another way to describe the conflict between San, a strong individualistic force, and Lady Eboshi, who is the leader of a great society. San who is fully committed to living with the wolves in the forest and to renouncing her association with the human race, while Eboshi has vowed to sustain her society of Irontown by any means 
which includes destroying the environment. Uh, the people of Irontown have a cons cohesive ideology and agree with Eboshi to protect Irontown and the cost of the environment's destruction. The different viewpoints of San and Lady Eboshi eventually leads to a physical altercation where they both aim to kill one another, and this dynamic between them represents the struggle to find a balance between the needs of individualism and those of conformity. So it's with these pieces of information that leads me to believe that this isn't a retelling of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, but instead is an improved version of it, as it told a story that and had a conclusion that Miyazaki was okay with, unlike with Nausicaa, where he didn't really like it at all because he didn't like the, the, the moral and the conclusion that it gave. As for my opinions on the film, as usual, the animation and music were both amazing, with the animation being some of the best that I've ever seen from Studio Ghibli. And you could tell that a lot of creative thought was used towards the animation compared to other films that Ghibli made, especially towards the ending. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen the film. And when it comes to the music, uh, recently I have been listening to a lot of Joe Hisaishi's music, because they are it's really good standalone music. If you just want to listen on on freaking Google Music or iTunes or Spotify or something, just just go ahead. It's really good. The characters are really well written, and if I'm going to be serious here, Princess Mononoke has one of the best stories I have ever seen because of the fact that Miyazaki wasn't throwing a cut-and-paste story about a hero and a villain at us, but instead he's giving off, some would say, a warning about the possible dangers that we as humans would do to society if we continue to threaten the national world and the wildlife living in it, in addition to, once again, showing both sides of the argument of humans versus nature. I know some people who would learn a lot from watching this film, and I know I learned a lot from watching it, and that's why I said at the beginning that this is my absolute favorite Studio Ghibli film. Now, uh, with all that said, do I even really need to give a rating to this? Do I really need to give this a rating? Do I? Well, I, I don't know. I guess not. Thank you guys for watching this very long Studio Ghibli review video. I've uh, absolutely been looking forward to talking about this movie. If you like Studio Ghibli, if you like Princess Mononoke, hit the like button down below. If you like this video, hit the like button down below. If you want to see any more reviews like this, you can hit the subscribe button either on the screen or down in the channel down below. If you don't want to watch any any other videos that I've made, uh, there are some on the screen, down in the channel, and down in the description down below. And with that, my name is Payne. I'll see you in the next video. God, this is exciting.